Are you ready for cocktails and conversation? This is Herspiration Happy Hour. Woo! So happy Wednesday, ladies. Evening. <laughs> happy Hello. Wednesday. Yes. So welcome you all to another episode of Herspiration Happy Hour. This is season four. This is episode five of our live stream. And if you want to get involved, I have the chat lines open. I'm definitely going to be tracking any questions that you ask, any feedback that you want to give. I got my eye on you all. So <laughs> with that, this is your unapologetic diva, Dr. G. This is Cortina Peters, aka the girlfriend therapist. And this is Louisa Harrell, aka Radio Red. And are you guys ready for your cocktail? Yes. Well, since we've had such a wonderful, warm, sunny day, I felt a little springish. So I decided to, you know, something simple, just to taste the spring. I like mojitos. So we're going to have a mojito, which is um, you need uh, the juice of one lime or four lime wedges. You need a um, teaspoon of granulated sugar, a small handful of mint leaves and white rum and soda water. So you take the, the sugar, the lime, or the lime juice, and the mint, and you muddle it in the bottom of a glass. Um, you add a handful of ice, stir it around, I mean, pour the rum in it, stir it around, and then top off with soda water. And you can garnish that with um, mint leaves and a lime wedge. So for the mocktail, um, you use the same ingredients except for the rum, and you use um, cooled, mint tea instead of the rum pour that in and then if you want the to top it off instead of the soda water you can do like ginger ale mm. okay sounds good sounds good and you know what so ladies there's so many things that's going on it is women's her what is her story month not his story it's her story uh-huh so it's Women's History Month, and what better way than to deliver some of our WCWs than to really be highlighting women on such a, a month, even though we are technically celebrated all year. I like to think so. We highlight women all year long <laughs> right here on this platform. So who are your ladies you know, crushing on today on this WCW? Well, I am crushing on Miss Tiffany Williams, who is the owner of Sankofa Essential Bookstore. Um, she's located in Tallahassee, Florida. And so because of the pandemic, she sells and highlights um, African-American books and literature. She is an educator. And so she said it's very important for her to spread and promote uh, literary works. Um, and so I actually just purchased two books. You guys can see it on my Facebook from her um, just to support just to support the business. And I think she's absolutely amazing. She's doing a lot of great things in Tallahassee, Florida. And so go support Sankofa Essential Bookstore. It's an online bookstore, but she has all of the bestsellers. She also has local authors um, as well. So, Okay. What about you, Louisa? Who are you crushing on today? Okay. So I am crushing on an actual, an artist, uh, Missy Elliott, actually. I picked Missy Elliott because you know, she's from the 90s, but she always comes back. Um, I didn't realize how many awards she had. Actually, she has uh, four Grammys, eight MTV Video Music Awards, um, a Billboard Women in Music Award for Innovator. She has been inducted into the uh, Songwriters Hall of Fame, and she's the first female to receive that. And that was in 2019. She has, of course, we all know about the Honorary Doctorate of Music. That she received, she has the from Berkeley College. Excuse me. Um, she has the Michael Jackson Video Vanguard Award, and she was the first woman to receive that. She also has the Women's Entrepreneurship Day Music Pioneer Award, and that was from the UN. And I picked her because, for one, I like Missy. For two, because of her music, and she came out recently. Uh, I'll say t last year during the pandemic with new music, so it kind of got everybody hyped. It kind of got everybody in the spirit of, you know not being so dragged down, but the how things used to be as far as music and having fun and going out and being with each other. So that's why Missy Elliott, a.k.a. Melissa Arnett Elliott, is my WCW. Okay. All right. A 
Okay, so for me today, I am choosing my WCW to be Dr. Ashley Little. Oh my gosh, first of all, her resume runs so long, so you're going to have to bear with me just getting all of these things out for her. I mean, she's the CEO and founder of Ashley Little uh, Enterprises, uh, which is, encompasses media, consulting work, writing, ghost writing for books, uh, publishing. She's a book coach, a project manager. She owns a magazine, public relations and marketing. I mean, she just does so much. She's also a TV and radio host, a speaker, a media maven, a journalist. Uh, and she's also a 12 time best-selling author. And that is just a small part of what she does because <laughs> she's also a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta. Uh, I mean, and she's a 12, like I said, she's a 12 times best-selling author. And one of the things that she, I love about her is that if you have a story that you want to tell, she will definitely help you reach your milestones of getting there. Uh, you, if anybody is really ever in Clubhouse, you've probably seen me, um, you know, co-host co some rooms with her about writing. So she's definitely amazing. And she, you know, you if you just google her i mean you will find out everything about her <laughs> that you want and so she is such an amazing spirit and a great collaborator and you know one of my dearest friends as well so shout out to you know dr ashley little who is my wcw for today so woo after that lady <laughs> What are we talking about today? I know our guest is an amazing and, you know, he suffered long, uh, and of course, can't see nobody's best friend. So is this is something dynamic that we're going to be able to have conversations about. So, and I think overall, when we, when we look at, um, you know, illness and when you lose a loved one, especially when you've been married to them, you know, what kind of inspiration will co can come from that? I mean, Cortina, you yourself are a two time cancer survivor and you you are very open and present about your your lupus. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what are some things that you, you know, feel or felt when you were going through this process as it pertains to your family? So the first time I was going through it, you know, I didn't have my daughter. Um, and so me being an only child, when I was sitting and having chemo, I was like, what if I don't make it? Like my mom will, like my mom, I am her life. Like she wouldn't, she would really not have anything. My dad is so sensitive and the legacy would end. And so prior to me having cancer, I never wanted children. And it wasn't until the choice was taken away from me, I felt um, that I was like, oh my God, maybe I should have somebody, <laughs> something to leave behind if something happens to me. And then the second time I got cancer, I did have a daughter. And so she was very young. Um, she was two. She was going to turning two. And so it was very scary because to have someone to grow up without a parent and um, it, to me, it can be very life changing. Mm -hmm. you go, you're really able to put what's important, those type of things into perspective. And so just being present, if you have mm -hmm. a loved one who is battling any sort of terminal illness or a very severe illness, be present with them. But also as the caretaker, it's important to listen to your own feelings because a lot of times caretakers don't get the recognition that they deserve. You know, sometimes us sick people can be a handful, you know, it can be very overwhelming. And so I wish that more people would give more credit to caretakers who are caring for individuals. Cause to watch someone that you love suffer every day. I can't imagine what my mom was going through and my dad, like seeing me having to go to chemo and radiation and my body being burned. And especially like your only child, you know, I'm on, um, I follow a little girl on face on Instagram and she's 11. She was in perfect health and she has childhood cancer and they only gave her a few more days left to live. Like oh looking like God. a year ago to where she is today. It is so, 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 so very sad. Um, 
And her mom always is posting and updating her followers. And she says she still is trying to like bob her head, but you can see the stark decline. She's had four brain surgeries and they just got the news a few hours ago. So it's very hard all around. So that's. God, that would make <sighs> totally, you know, emotional, especially when it's your child. You know, I just can't. I mean, having an adult with cancer is already hard enough, but, you know, to have a child that's sick, it's like, yeah. you, and as a parent, you can't take that pain away from them. So I can't imagine what those parents must be feeling to get that kind right. of, or that level of news that has to be super traumatizing. Um, so just a little bit early on, we're going to go ahead and bring our guest on, uh, Miss Rachel Engstrom. Uh, who is the author, um, well, she authored a book, and it, I think it's called, what is it? Uh, Wife, Widow, Wife, Now Widow, What? Widow, what was the last one? Now What? Now What? That's a powerful question, honestly, because, I mean, just hearing some of this already is making me feel like, wow. Um, so we're going to, to bring her on. Uh, she'll be coming and popping in in just a second. Hello oh, there. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thanks for Thank having me, ladies. Thank you. How are you today? Not too bad. I'm glad it's partway through the week. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's always a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you, you authored this book. And so what was your inspiration behind this? I mean, because, you know, of course, it's wife, widow, now what? I, I can, you know, tell us a little bit about your journey and your story to getting to the place where you felt comfortable putting a book out. Yeah. So I met this really nice guy when I was 19. He was about to be 26. And then I got married when I was 22. He was about to be 28. And when I was 28, he just thought he had the flu, you know, went to the doctors and it turned out he had leukemia. Um, so at 28, I was thrown into this complete world. I knew nothing about, you know, balancing work and running back and forth to, you know, let the animals out after work and then running to the hospital and back and forth and back and forth and just this whole life. And I had to figure out how to navigate, you know, serious amounts of insurance and his disability and can he work and, you know, all these different things. And then, um, so he was ill for two years and three months and then, um, two days after I turned 31 in 2013, I had to take him off life support. His body no. just, his body just couldn't do it anymore. And we'd been married eight and a half years. I was with him 11 and a half years. So it was like my whole adult life to that point was with him. And about a year after he died, you know, I'm trying to figure out widowhood, my life, you know, I had to reboot myself like a computer <laughs> You know, it was all of it, the cancer part and the illness and then the widow part. It was really ugly and really hard. And I, you know, there are resources and things out there, but nothing really how to navigate all of it. So this book, Wife, Widow, Now What, is my story and chronological order of all my Facebook posts, all our team, Grayson, his name is Grayson Post, rallying when he's sick, caring bridge, the medical post things, all of it in order with my narrative. And then it's like, when I'm trying to figure out insurance, I help you navigate insurance. So it's it's a how-to. Um, so I just wanted to put pen to paper because it's really hard and you really feel alone. You really feel like you're the only one going through it. So this is the first of its kind where it's the story plus the resources. And it's literally like, like we're having a cup of tea or we're having a cocktail or we're having something. And I'm telling you, you're not alone. You know, this sucked and it was really hard, but you can do it, you know, and this is, this is how I did it. And I believe you can do it too. Yeah. Wow. Um, do any of you ladies have any questions? When you were going through it, what was your support system like? Cause you being so young, what was mm -hmm. that like? What did that look like? Yeah. So I was really blessed. My parents are, I'm the youngest of four. Um, my parents mm -hmm. are older and they um, were able to come. I'm from Michigan. So they actually took shifts. They lived with us um, on and off shifts. And, you know, they just celebrated like their 55th wedding anniversary. So they were like, you know, kind of ships in the night passing each other. They'd spend a day or two together. But for 18 months of the 27 months, they came and lived with us. So that was that was amazing. And siblings from afar, you know, care packages 
self-care packages, all kinds of things. But I'd really say my presence on social media it saved my life in lots of ways because even just people saying, I'm so sorry to hear that, or, you know, we're thinking of you, we're praying for you. All of that meant so much to me. Wow. Do you feel that you documenting that was also helpful for you? Because a lot of times when individuals go through things and the other party does not necessarily make it, they reflect back and have all of these what ifs, like the memories are gone. I can't really, even though it might be difficult or it might be hard, just having that documented to say, I went through this with the man that I loved and he's no longer here, but I have the memories of reflecting on our fight together. Yeah, that was very, very helpful. And also I made like this healing blog, which was, you know, about a third of the friends that I had on Facebook where I would go and I would just bleed through my writing and different things like that. So having all that to look back on, I actually, to write certain certain aspects of, you know, his health and whatnot in the book, it was amazing because we had these communication notebooks to write down, you know, because I was working and be like, when the doctors came in, what did they talk about? I actually still have the notebooks and some of it, you know, it's a blessing because it was some of it was in his own handwriting. Mm -hmm. So those different things, having that and then it'll be eight years in April. But I'm like, girl, you did some good writing during the ugly times. Like, it's cool to have that to reflect on because it it literally is a snapshot mm -hmm. when it happened, what it was. And you can see like when I was a widow, like some days I'm like, today it's so good. I can't believe how great I feel. And then the next day I'm like, I can't stop crying. <laughs> so it's. I mean, it's, it's an accurate reflection that you're not going to get in, you know, movies and, you know, different things like that. So, so, yeah. so when did you publish the book? Yeah, it just came out this last fall at the end of September. Okay. How long did it take you to, to put all of this? And as you were putting all of this together, was there, you know, because there has been eight years since, you know, he passed, was there a... Did you then grieve again? You know, because I think that's what I, I, in me, if I'm looking back at all of these memories and I'm going through it and I'm writing a book, I feel like that's like secondary grieving. Oh my gosh, it was. It was very painful. I started putting the post together when I thought of it in like 2014. And then it was like, this is just too much. It's too close. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say to actually write it, it probably took me about two years. Um, to get it all out, but it's because I edited, it. I had a professional editor, but because I edited it myself so many times as well, it's like, okay, this is the part, like even just thinking about writing about when he dies gave me so much anxiety. Um, but at each time I did edit it again and again and again, what was really freeing is I felt farther from it. It, it to the point where when I look at it, you know, this is, this is the cover. When I look at it, I'm just like, who, like, I, I honestly feel really sad for this person. I mean, I'm amazed at how strong she is, but I'm like, that girl went through so much stuff. Like, holy crap, cats. Like, you know, whoa. Like, how did she do it? <laughs> and it's crazy because it's me. And I talk about in there how, like, if I didn't have his name tattooed on my wrist and, you know, all these different things, like, would I really believe that it happened? Because it was just so hard. You know, so then what is, you know, fast forward and I mean, this is just um, I'm very open. What is love like after such a traumatic um, loss? Yeah, you know, so I met him when I was 19 and then trying to date again. <laughs> I did not know what it was like out there. Oh, God. I did not know what it was like. I got played like a record. Oh, it was awful. Um, I just trusted people. I had no idea. And it's like my church, everybody, you know, when they were older, or already married or whatever. So it's I wasn't looking at church. I I was working three, tar three part-time jobs, just hustling, trying to do what I could to, you know, pay for my house. I thought that I would have another person help me pay for it. So it's just like I was going out, drinking too much, dating too much, um, making stupid choices. And, you know, there was like this one guy, like I thought he was so great. 
And then he's like, I just, I, I'm so stressed out. I need more time to focus on my career or whatever. And I totally believed him. And then I found him like a couple weeks later on the app. Like he'd been on there the whole time. Like, cause you can wow. see like times, time stamped. And I was just like, so sad. And I was like, why am I so sad over someone? And it's just like, what was really interesting. And I, I forget this. Like, I haven't talked about this with other people I've talked to. I forgot this, how my... I had so much invested in this other person for so many years that like, no matter what job I had or where we lived or what was going on, he was the constant. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I didn't have that stability, it's not that I wasn't a good person and I knew that I was good and I deserved good, but it was like, I was looking for my other half so much. And I believed Mm -hmm. how I like to, how I like to say it is, you know, when you have like a vacation or something coming up and you don't know what it looks like, but you're like, Ooh, I have seven days and it's great. And then, you know, you're in your vacation. I'm like, I have four days left. Like you're just excited. I knew God had a plan. I knew, you know, he was going to take care of me, but I didn't know what, what it was. But within that, I was so craving someone to just give a crap about me because I don't have any family that lives here in the Minneapolis area and my friends and family, my family of friends and people, they cared, but not, you know, you're on your own. You're really on your own. People go back to their own life after the big crisis and things like that. But I really lost a lot of lack of respect for myself that I didn't realize at the time. Like I just, Mm -hmm. I held so much value in like, Ooh, did, did he text me to do whatever? Like, And I was like, how did I get this stupid? Like, I have a master's degree. (laughs) You know what I mean? So it's like you go through these different things in life and these different areas that you didn't expect. Like, um, one of you was talking about going through cancer and what were your parents thinking and all those different things. Like, one of my best girlfriends in my life was like, yeah, you were dating a lot. You were like um, Yosemite Sam, like pew, pew, pew. Like, we could have told you to stop. But you wouldn't have listened. She's like, you would have just kept going on to the next loser because you were just in that bad place. But when you're in it, you can't see it. But yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's necessary to go through those as well because you have to understand you had, I like to call them double loss with my patients because it's not just the anticipatory grief because he was dying. So it was anticipated. It didn't make it any easier. (laughs) And you also were grieving the loss of your life partner. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people don't understand that grief. Yes, you can grieve someone of a physical death, but emotional separation where that person is no longer in your life. That's also difficult because I had always um, a date, right? If that's my Mm -hmm. husband, that's always my date. That's the person who I share the housing bills with. That's the person who I can laugh with. We build our family traditions, our Christmases, our Thanksgivings and everything like that. So in addition to losing him as a person, you also lost sharing your life or the ideas and the dreams that you had in your mind that you were going to build. So that's very tough. And it takes time to rebuild that and to really Mm -hmm. find yourself. Um, And so I'm not surprised that you experienced that and went through that. And I think this is going to sound crazy that you needed that in that moment. Oh yeah. Because that's where you were. And then you were able to come out of that and then, be who you are today yeah Yeah, and it's like it you know all those I remember at one point being in my kitchen doing something and just being like oh my gosh I will never have the inside jokes with him I will never have that like you just miss those tiny things so much yeah for sure yeah I also think that when you are in a relationship especially when you are married not real not realizing or not consciously you give so much that you forget about yourself. Mm -hmm. And when you, in absence of that, you now have to reestablish not only who you were, because who who was I in this comfortable zone before I met this person? Who am I now? Mm -hmm. And so you went through this cycle of like, I don't know who I am without this person because all of this time I've had, like as Cortina say, my other half, I always had a constant date. And so you, you, it's not, and I don't, I don't even equate it to like spiraling. I just think that you just was, you know, cruising without really even giving thought to 
you know, yourself, if that makes sense. It's like, am I, am, I'm not, you're not pouring enough into yourself because you're really wanting what you used to have, not realizing that, wow, that doesn't, that doesn't make you who you are. It, uh, it contributes, but you lost yourself in that. And, and that happens a lot of times when you're young. You said you met him when you were 19. Mm -hmm. So it's like at 19, every, that person becomes your world. Yeah. And it was your world for, you said, eight years. That's 11 and a half total. Know, yeah. A lot, mm -hmm. okay, so 11 and a they half. They were married for eight. Yeah. Yeah. So you were married for eight, but together for, uh, you know, that's majority of your, a good bit of your young adulthood. Mm hmm. <laughs> know anything else. So, yeah, definitely that shift in time. Oh, I can imagine technology and dates and the people <laughs> manipulating. Yeah. And then what <laughs> was really crazy is. Because he was sick, I was taking care of him all the time. So, like, after he was dead, I mean, it sounds crass, but, you know, it's after he had died, it was like I still felt like I was a hamster on the hamster wheel. And I had all these things. And it was like, how do I, like, stop the racing feeling? How do I stop that? But going back to the loss thing. So, I actually had endometriosis really bad before there were pills and PSAs and all this stuff. So, I had pain so bad I could barely walk. Um, I was on Vicodin, all kinds of stuff. I'd had surgeries like right before he had his bone marrow transplant. We're sitting there on like the transplant day, both on our mutual pain meds. Like, uh. so it's just, and when you have cancer and you're so young, they have you harvest your eggs or yep. freeze your sperm. Mm -hmm. So after he died, he's gone. Then I decide my quality of life is so bad I have a hysterectomy. So then I grieve that entire thing and then I destroy his sperm. So it, and then like six months after he dies, his cat becomes really sick and I have to put the cat down. So it's just like all these levels of things kept happening and it was just like so many different little deaths. And I, you know, I still grieve today that I can't have kids in certain aspects, but it's like, Everywhere you look, like people have their pretty kids on social media, and you're like, I don't want to see none of you. Like, <laughs> so it's it was just varying levels of so many dynamics all at one time for sure. Oh yeah, you know what? So, I think I shared this before. Um, I, well, I tell you guys all the time, like I never wanted children, and the doctors came out and asked me, did I want to freeze my eggs? And I was like, no, you can scramble them, boil them, fry them. I don't really care. Um, I'm not going to use them. So I don't really care. No. And then it wasn't until that first chemotherapy. And I'm like, did I just make the biggest mistake of my life? Because what, what if I do? And it, it's something about the choice being taken away from you. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, in my mind, I was like, no, I don't want them. But then when they told me I'm sitting there in chemo, I'm like, I said, no, but what if I meant yes? And the likelihood of me being able to have children. And so my daughter is a miracle baby. But after that, because I had blood clotting issues, I had a lot of complications. They told me I would never be able to have children. Or if I did, I would not be able to carry to term. And I've had three miscarriages. And so they were absolutely mm -hmm. right. So yeah, it's a I'm, lot. I'm on the extreme with you, I think. But so I think what becomes also um, probably for you is like another grieving is that when people don't know your history, especially if you want to be private, because nobody just openly says, hey, I had a hysterectomy, unless you're on this podcast. And, you know, unless like, you're me. And I'm like, I don't have a yeah, say unless you're on this <laughs> podcast. And then, you know, we all be like, yeah, OK, best thing ever. Um, but when people are intrusive to keep asking you, when are you going to have kids? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a woman's choice to share whether or not they had a hysterectomy or anything else. But people just naturally assume that because you're a woman, you should have kids. Mm -hmm. You should want to be a, a parent. And I've always just said, fuck no, unless you carry them and, and take care of them. I'm, I'm a bomb auntie. I'm, I will give it up all day. But I, I made the choice not to want to have any. Mm -hmm. so when I made the choice at 38, it didn't bother me. And I can see a, a million people's kids at this point. And I'm like, yeah, I know what happens. I have five nieces, five nephews. I know what happens be behind all these pretty pictures. So I know <laughs> anything. But I mean, but for you having to grieve, not only destroying the sperm and having to have a hysterectomy and all of those things, 
And then people who you've not been open to or people just meet you. And I'm sure you probably still get it when they say, do you have kids? And you can say, no. Oh, when are you going to have some kids? Are you going to have some kids? To me, that's just such a level of intrusiveness that is none of their damn business. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting is several of my friends don't have children. And it's like a lot of us have, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in student loans for going to school or doing different things like that. And, you know, you watch like shows like Rosanna or whatever, and you're like, they could barely afford themselves. Like how, I don't even know how I would budget a kid even, and I have a good job. Like, how would I, you know what I mean? And it's just Mm -hmm. those, those dynamics of those things. And I don't think people really factor it in yet because it's still just the norm, but yeah, they're there. I mean, my body just unfortunately was not one that would work with that and that's okay. And I like, I was a professional nanny in my twenties and raised babies. And, you know, so I really thought that this was going to be something that I'd have, but the enter, I mean, the amount of stuff I'm doing now. So actually a week from tomorrow, um, I, so I went from being this like sad widow, right. To a week from tomorrow, I'm running for woman of the year here in the twin cities, um, trying to raise $60,000 for the leukemia and lymphoma society in my late husband's name. So I'm, I'm, you know, reaching out to all these businesses. I have a team of several people behind me. And it's just like, if I had a little running around, I wouldn't be able to do this. So God knew what was happening, knew, you know, despite the pain, despite all that, I really do feel like, um, I don't, I don't really believe in everything happens for a reason because there are really bad things that happen to people sometimes, but I believe that we're given the grace of how to deal with things. Mm -hmm. And in my story, you know, I feel like it's my mission Um, or my ministry per se to let people know they're not alone in this, let people know, you know, one in it's like every three minutes, someone's diagnosed with a blood cancer. This is the number one cancer in kids. 80% of people that were childhood cancer survivors, um, go on to have major health conditions, stuff like Mm -hmm. that. So it's just like, you know, the energy that I would have um, to have to be chasing a child and taking care of them, I'm funneling in this other way, and I'm really proud to be able to do that. So I do like the night every year because yeah. I had I had lymphoma. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when you said leukemia and lymphoma foundation, I'm like, yay! Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I have a question regarding your book. How yeah. transparent were you? You know, in your book, I know you shared your post and and everything you've written, but did you also share your transition to where you are now? Because I mean, and you know, you you seem like you journaled a lot to get to this story, but people who are dealing with the aftermath and years after just saying that you're never really healed, I think you just learn how to cope, and that's de- any death that you grieve. So. Did you share like your experiences with going back out in the dating world or just learning? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I had a, I changed the, I have really funny chapter names. Um, like I have when he had to go give his sperm sample, it's like called, um, Tutti Frutti because they had (laughs) pumped into the room. It was like a sink, paper towel, um, soap a big leather chair, a rack of porn and Mm -hmm. pumped into the room was like tutti frutti. Oh, Rhoda. And you couldn't (laughs) turn it down. And it was like blue suede shoes and stuff. So like I changed the, I changed the title of the dating one. It was like the good, the bad, the ugly and the really ugly. Cause I was like, I don't know if that's trademarked (laughs) anywhere, but no, I totally talk about it. I totally talk about that. I totally talk about I don't talk about love in my life now because that's something you have to read my book for because it's a it's a cool little catch. But <laughs> you did no, um, did you but first of all did you put in your book the pew pew? Did you put that part? Yes, in? I did. <laughs> I have like how I escaped a Buddhist retreat. I've got all <laughs> kinds of stuff in there. Like it's good. It is good. I have like there's a lot of juicy stuff in there. I mean, it's like. I've been told it's like a toolbox of resources, but it's also, I mean, it's a love story and it's how I, how I got here now, but no, I have, I have tons of stuff. I did filter a lot of things because I know I was like, I know my mom and dad, I know they're watching this right now. They're almost 75 and almost 82. And I was like, I know my mom and dad are going to be reading this. Love now is going to be reading this. My pastor could read this. (laughs) 
<laughs> we'll just we'll just make this more applicable to what it needs to be. But like, I was talking to this guy on the phone, and I remember clear as day. He looked like um, via the site. So I'm talking to this guy. He looks like Wy- Wyclef Jean. And we're talking and it's raining because I can hear the windshield wipers thump, 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 thump. And all of a sudden he goes, oh, so your husband had cancer. Did you catch it from him? And I was like. And at this point, I had like this interview process, like we talk online for a little bit and then we text and then we talk on the phone. And I think I just hung up on him, which seems really rude, but it was just like, I can't, dude. (laughs) That, that probably was not rude. That was probably the smartest thing you could have ever done. <laughs> yeah, I had the same experience. My ex-fiance, he uh, he was like, can I catch it? I, 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 I know I told y'all that. I.e. were weird. not married. I'm sorry, but you, you, did, you did not say anything about him thinking that he can catch cancer. From I'll you. tell you guys about that later because this is about our <laughs> guest. But I'll tell you guys about that story later. Yes, he asked me, could, could he catch it? Let me ask you, so have you ever heard of the Stevens Ministry? Mm -mm. Okay, so this is a um, ministry where they deal with people, help people grieve. Um, So it's like they're the people that come in after everyone leaves. So, you know, mm-hmm. after the funeral, after the reception, I mean, after not the reception, I'm sorry. Repass. The repass. And, and then after the phone stopped ringing, after you stop receiving the cards and the, the food and everything, they come in and help you deal. So I was just sitting here thinking, like, your book could be like a, a, a modern or up-to-date Stevens ministry for people who don't know how to cope and deal with loss or who had to be the caregivers, who had to be the family that deals with the person that's sick. So I was just like, that's that's really cool. And I wanted to ask you what part, because um, you were your Sammy Sam, your friend said, <laughs> you went through your, your several level, levels of grieving. When was the turnaround? When was the, the snatch you out of that? When was that for you? You know, I think it was when I met the person I'm with now. Um, Part of it was I got a new job at a new, completely new place. I wasn't running around. So I had like um, three jobs as a personal care attendant, two for autistic kids, one for a lady with MS. So I'm running back and forth, driving all over the Twin Cities. So when you're that busy, you just are in survival mode. I was having garage sales, hustling, selling stuff online, doing whatever I could. And I think it was, you know, one of my sisters, you know, she's my siblings, like what you're saying about your mom and dad, like, I can't imagine what it was like to be them watching me go through all of it. My brother, who's 14 years older than me, was in the ICU and almost died from COVID over Christmas. So that was the closest I could get to. I mean, he had to decide like to fight to live because you can't you can't breathe like your body wants. You have to teach your body to breathe and all this stuff. Super scary. But um, I think it was when I like, quote unquote, started a new life. So I got a new life at the mental health insurance company where I work like five and a half years ago. And it was just like, OK, I'm in this new place. I'm going to make friendships. I'm going to start over. I'm going to do this. This is going to be like my big girl professional job. I haven't had one in a few years. And it was, I mean, part of it was just like, this is a stable paycheck. I know what's going to keep me going. I know what's going to happen. And I read a lot. I just for kicks, I, um, I ended up not getting the certification because I didn't pay the $250 I should have, but I took all the classes to get a certification in grief counseling. So I read about, you know, ambiguous loss and, you know, all these types of things. And when people call to get counseling and I talk to them now, I feel like God puts widows and widowers in my line sometimes to be able to say, you know, I've been there. I can do it. You know, are you, you know, I believe, you know, you'll be okay. Counseling will help. Da 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 da. But I really feel like it was, you know, I really do feel healed. I'm okay. It took a really long time to get here. I think. I have the grace and the gift of feeling more healed than most people because I wrote it down on paper and that was really Mm -hmm. cathartic. And I think that that's Mm -hmm. something a lot of people don't have the the gift of that. Um, The huge gift is that I was with him and watched his body fall apart. So it made sense in the grand scheme why it happened. He didn't get hit by a truck. He didn't get blown up in Afghanistan. 
He didn't come. I talk about, you know, the different widow groups I was a part of and different things. He didn't, um, you know, come back from Afghanistan and then take his life because he couldn't handle his demons. His body just fell apart. Right. So I was able to be there. I was able to see it. And it was sensical, you know, not in the grand scheme, but like I, when I, my book came out, I was looking for, you know, people that would want to read it, who I could help. And this woman I found, we're now like sisters. She's in Winnipeg. Her husband was diagnosed with leukemia in January of 2018. She took care of him. Then May of 2020 last year, she got the exact same kind of leukemia. Like, how does that happen? And then he died in September of last year. So now she's fighting, um, fighting for her life by herself in Winnipeg during mm. COVID, trying to, you know, grieve if she can, you know, you don't really have the energy. <clears throat> and that's just like so nonsensical, right? So it's just, I think that being able to have the gift of time with him, also he worked nights. So I didn't spend much time with him the whole time we were together during the week. This gave us the gift of time, all those types of things. And what I really focus on in my book is, you know, this is my story and only my story, but here are nuggets you can get out of it. I think would be applicable. Of course, all the resources on how to navigate stuff is really crucial to help people. But I think all the hindsight that I have years later of I should have done this or I should have done that you know when people want to help these are applicable things say yeah you know cut my grass shovel my driveway do these different things but I focus on um grace just the grace that I had to give myself that I didn't know at the time didn't know what I needed but I mean I got to the point where it was like I was asking on Facebook like please text me I'm just feeling like shit like please text me I had a friend come over and take me like, for a walk like a dog. Yes, like an actual dose. She was like, come on, we need to come out of the house. You know, I left my dog inside and we went for a walk with her. But those things like you just, you use, you, you know, humor, watching funny TV, you know, having good relationships, even if it's only with a couple people that check in with you or you check in with them. Those are like the crucial things that you learn along the grief journey that really bring you to the next level of where mm -hmm. you need to be. But because there's no roadmap and no guide and no timeline, I think that's really hard for people that aren't in it to understand because everyone's grief is different. Everyone's grief, you know, has a different timeline and that's really tricky. So I just have, before we let you go, I just want to ask a question. When did you feel like it was time to create this book? What, what was the, the inspiration to say now it's time? Um, well, like I, I just put the post in order, like I was saying in 2014, because I thought, you know, this is cool. And I remember sitting next to a guy on a plane and I was like, would you read a book that was like, you know, how social media saved my life? That was the title at the time. And he's like, yeah, I would. That sounds really interesting. Cause I gave him the premise. I think it was when <clears throat> I was learning of more and more people in the world around me, whether I knew them or not, that were struggling with what do I do? widows, widowers, um, people losing their children, things like that. And right now with COVID, it's so applicable. I mean, so many people are losing their spouses, but I really think that it was, I was at this level of comfort in my new relationship and in my new life that I was like, you know what, God, I hear you. I need to help other people because it's ugly out there. And, you know, it's, it's really like you're getting dropped out of a plane in a country you don't know, the language you don't know, you don't have a backpack, survival, anything. So I wanted to provide that to other people so they wouldn't, hopefully, God willing, they don't feel like I did at the time when I didn't have anything to resource like that. Okay. And where can people pick your book up at? And, yeah. And, so And yeah. also tell people where they can connect with you at. Yeah, so this is what it looks like. It's Wife, Widow, Now What? Um, you can find it on Amazon. It's in paperback or um, digital. You can just download it. And then if you want paperback, you can actually write in it. I have a budget sheet, things like that. Digital, you can click on the hyperlinks, go to cancer websites, finances, whatnot. Um, but yeah, you can find it on there. And you can find me, Wife, Widow, Now What? on Instagram or Facebook. And I even have a little support group on Facebook, if people want to be part of that, ask questions. But yeah, definitely please reach out because you're not alone and I'd love to help. Have you ever heard of Cancer Wellness Magazine? 
Mm -hmm. Have you been featured in that yet? Not yet. They were there's kind of like a waiting list for that, but because um, I, I, I was featured in it, and so I okay. want to send your information to the um writer. Thank you. So they have like a um, they just recently did a spotlight on um, like families mm -hmm. of individuals who um, either were, were living with cancer or who um, unfortunately passed away, and so just hearing your story, I think what you're doing is great, and so um. I know Pam probably had your email address and so put you on an email with the writer. That'd be amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me today, ladies. Yes. Oh, yes. Very welcome. Very, very welcome. Thank you so much for coming by. And we certainly appreciate one, your transparency and your honesty, and then all of the nuggets that you did give. And all I would say to everybody who is definitely viewing, go get her book because it's, even though she talks about becoming a widow because of cancer, death has, you know, a, a grieving process for everybody, no matter what it is. And I think that's what, you know, the importance of your message and in your book, because sometimes you're not giving a, given a time. You mm -hmm. were graced with being given a time. Yes. I mean, it was, a, it was a painful time, but you got time when some people didn't have an opportunity to have. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that your book is a valuable nugget for a lot of families who are transitioning um, or a family that may end up transitioning. And I'm sure there's some vital nuggets in it. I certainly will get it because I think that no matter what, I want to be able to be in the right frame of mind to start planning for family, whether it's a mother, brother, sister, you know, dad, you know good friend, anything that I will be able to lend information and that mm -hmm. is, information is power. So it yeah. is Thank just you. like schoolhouse rocks. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We definitely appreciate, appreciate you coming by and you know, we will be in touch with you. Thank you yeah. so much, ladies. Have a good evening. Yes, you too. You too. Thanks. Right. Bye. Woo. Ladies, that was amazing. Yeah, it was. It was. And so let me just let me just put you on blast real quick, Portina. I wouldn't have her email because that's not what I normally do. That's that's Louisa. Oh my bad. <laughs> <laughs> Louisa, can you get me her information? I will. <laughs> I'm like, what she said, I'm like, eh, she probably watched this later and be a whole deal. Well, you know, you know yeah, everybody. Like, oh, but but let me let me just really bust you out. I could get you her email, but I was just saying normally it wouldn't come through me. I see the emails that come in. Oh. You, my dear, just show up. I love your life. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, anybody who's watching, I'm throwing, yes, I am throwing her under the bus that she just shows up here, made up and beautiful, and just with her glory. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. While me and Louisa slave uh, for this podcast, because you know, and I give it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, well, you do more it, slave it, it, than I do. Goodness, but no, let me, let me. I was getting ready to say, let me give kudos and to anybody that is watching. I'm going to give kudos because if you want to be featured, and lately it has been coming in droves, and like for real, you know, we have not done outreach. People are wanting to be a part, and I and I know the rest of the ladies are so thankful because yeah. of what the platform means. But I will out. say we have roles here in this group, but all of the outreach comes from Louisa. I I am the, the editor. I am the I create all the content. I'm the writer of the group. But I do nothing. I, I'm just I'm a resident here. therapist. I'm nothing. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's it. That's all you know. You know what, Colton? <laughs> She's as cute as the office that she's sitting in. That's it. That's it. She's as cute as the offices that she's sitting in. Other than that, we love her on this platform, though, but I'm just saying. So if, and, and I will encourage anybody, if you know someone that has a moving story, yeah, and because knowledge really is truly power. You know, reach out to herspirationhappyhour at gmail.com. Louisa will get that email. <laughs> yes, I will. And we will be conversing and trying to get you scheduled. <laughs> yes, yes. I do know because, and you know what? People have made the mistake, hold on, you know, of emailing me personally through my Instagram because my email is attached as a contact. 
And then they'll then they hit me back and say, I didn't hear from you. Huh. And I'm thinking, what email did you send this to? Then I she's like, did you hear from such and such? I'm like, I didn't see an email from anybody. She's like, you know what? I had to go back and look. So here's the funny part is like, I had to write back and let, let him know and say, I said, you, you didn't send it where I told you to send it. I don't pay attention to stuff like that when it comes to my actual business uh, individual account. When I said, send the email to Herspiration Happy Hour at Gmail, and I'm even specific, and Louisa will get you scheduled. Because I, I ain't got time for that. You <clears throat> do all day? Hells to the no. <laughs> <laughs> so before we wrap up, we still have, we still have a few minutes. Uh, Cortina, I need to hear this story about your husband thinking, or your fiance thinking he can get cancer. I'm yes. assuming from being intimate with you. So you guys do know, I found that I had cancer sitting in Macy's. I think I told you guys what? that before. No, you didn't. Stop acting like you tell us everything. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, when I found that I had cancer, I was sitting in Macy's doing my bridal registry. So we kind of rolled home in silence. Um, the first person I told was my very dear um, and my oldest best friend, Ashley. You know, I called her. She came over um, and I was just kind of like stuck. So I remember I was in the in the kitchen standing one day. This was like a few days maybe after I got it. I don't know if he didn't know what to say, but he was like, can I get it? Uh, no. It's not an STD. <laughs> no, you can't get it. Um, and so needless to say, physically he was present, but emotionally, I remember there was a time when I was in the kitchen, like throwing up. I was sick after chemo one day and he didn't even get off the sofa to come see if I was okay. Um, and so we were supposed to get married. Like when I found that I had cancer, the venue was paid for all the bridesmaids had their dresses. Like I found out in August, the end of August, um, my wedding was supposed to be in October. So everything was done, invitations, everything. Um, and so once I got cancer, we pushed the wedding back. And then in December, I made the decision not to to just break off the entire relationship because I was like, when you get married, it's for sickness and in health to death do us part. And I just wasn't feeling it. My life took a totally different direction. So we were engaged, but we ended up not getting married, you know? And I think that was one of the best decisions I ever made because a lot of times people get married for the wedding and not for the marriage. And so I really listened to me. And like I said, getting a terminal illness um, or something that could be terminal changes your perception, you know? And I was like, you know what? I just want to enjoy life. Like I want to know what it is to, to live and do these things. And I don't want to live my life with regrets. So I made that decision and that's where I am. But yeah, he asked me, could he get it? That is... I don't know if that's just insensitive or ignorant. I mean, I, I think it's both. But I, what I will say is, you know, you was having all of these. I, I can say this now because I've met you and you're such an amazing person and you're here to live to tell your story. So, you know, anybody don't get offended because we be keeping it real on here. I, I, I do think that when you were planning all of this and perhaps God was giving you signs that this is something you should not have been a part of. And he had to give you something that was going to really wake you up. I don't even know. Like, as a person, um, <laughs> who I was back then is not who I am right now, right? Because don't he was a minister. That shows you who you are. Your value in marriage was in sickness and in health. Yeah. To show you who you were going to marry before you did that. You had planned all of these things, and he had to show you what you would have been getting. And then every, even after that, you know, um, 
<laughs> he got my name tattooed on him. Now he had no tattoos. He was totally against tattoos, did not believe in them. After we broke up, he showed up to my job with my name tattooed on him. After we broke up, who gets somebody's name tattooed on them after they break up? I have absolutely no idea. But that was a big gesture to me to indicate how serious he was. But I at that point, I was no longer in love. And so I don't believe in forcing anything. Um He's a good person, just not a good partner, mm-hmm. you know? And so like he went on and it, I, I hear stories about people he started dating and how he was always looking for a me because I did like a lot of stuff for his parents. They were pastors, like creating things and, and everything. And um, it was, <laughs> it was just the funniest thing. I haven't seen him in like, ye- well, I don't even live there in, down there anymore, but years. And he was 10 years older than me. Oh, wow. So, well, look how look how impressionable you are. That's how did you know? Yeah. He was trying to find someone to imitate what you, you know, who you Exactly. Were. I tell him, Sharon, <laughs> y'all mess up with me, okay? You're going to be looking for me with a flashlight in the daytime because you ain't going to find nobody like me. I'm not, I'm serious. Like, I'm a cancer. We're very loving and affectionate and we give our all and we're sensitive and we're loyal. But when you cross us, when we done, we done. We put up with a whole bunch of stuff. Water signs. Well, I'm a little bit land and water. You know, I'm a Scorpio. You're a Cancer, so that's just why we have a lot of commonalities. Louisa, what are you? A Leo. Oh. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Do not do that. Okay. Okay. You know what? The best person you could ever have in your life, daggone it. But I, I have um, two cancer girls in my house. I have a Libra, I have a Virgo, I have a Libra son, a Virgo girl, and a Taurus son. So I have a whole lot, a lot of... In he was a Leo, too. Was he? See, the Leo men and the Leo women are two separate breeds. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotta- okay. See, my crazy, my crazy is the cancer. The total narcissist was a cancer. Yes. Oh. Yeah, he was a well, cancer. I'm going a, I'm to a take one out of Louisa's book. He was a cancer man, <laughs> not a cancer but man. You think about it. It, it is like that, though. Yeah. Each side, I don't know what's up with the man. I'm gonna, they're wonderful, <laughs> but it's something about this. I, I just don't, especially the Leo men. A lot of them, not all of them, a lot of them are trip. I, I'm seeing it. And mm-hmm. So, you know what? I know, look, we're on our time, so... <laughs> Uh, Cortina, where can people find you at and follow you and get some insight about, you know, all of the great things that you are doing? Because, oh my gosh, you have some of the best posts and they be so <laughs> inspirational. They be giving me life on some mornings that I like literally life. So where can people follow you at? You can find me at the Girlfriend Therapist on all social media platforms. I'm no longer the emo, um, TikTok's emotional expert because I don't know my password. Um, so I have to make a new TikTok account. Um, and you can <laughs> visit my website at I am Cortina, C O R T I N A, Peters, P E T E R S dot com. Y'all know I'm crazy. Uh, you know, uh, trust me, we know. And, and the fact that we've all hung out away from all of this and together, uh, yeah, we know. Uh, Lisa, where can people find you? Uh, at the Blue Phoenix on Facebook and the Blue Phoenix Hills on Instagram. All right. And as for me, you can follow me on all platforms at I am Dr. P. Gurley, D R P G U R L E Y. And for the Herspiration Happy Hour, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Herspiration Happy Hour and on Twitter at Herspiration H H. Because the name is so damn long, we got we got cut off. So, <laughs> so definitely tune in. You can always catch us. We are on damn near every platform now from Pandora to Amazon to iHeartRadio to Buzzsprout Podcaster. I mean, all kind of stuff. So if you and then also check out our, you know, if you you can either catch it, you know, previous episodes here or you can catch it on our YouTube channel at Herspiration Happy Hour. So we are always so grateful and thankful to have people, you know, check in and we have some amazing guests coming. And I actually, you know, normally where we get a span of time where it's just us three. 
I, I give it up to the universe. I don't know who prayed for things to get better <laughs> or not get better, but get more people. Uh, oh, we're going to be busy. We are going to be and then I don't. I think if you want to be a, a guest on the show, what I will say is I think we might be out to what is it? We I think we're, we're in June. We're in June. Mm -hmm. June. So I, for everybody who we is might be going into July. We're June and July. Yeah. Okay, so we're in June and July already with guests, and I, you know we always keep some magnificent magnificent guests coming on. Again, if you want to be a guest on the show. Hit us at or herspiration happy hour at gmail.com and Louisa will get you scheduled. Uh, just make sure you include your bio and a headshot when you submit your, you know, your request. And so we thankful so much for everybody stopping by and and you know, just welcome to the next episode. Yay!